what physics is about. I thought I knew. <laughs> uh, when I was in high school, I had this vague notion that physics was supposed to be rational. And one day I came across a question on the internet. A person says, is uh, quantum mechanics irrational and illogical? And these are some of the answers he got. Why do humans want everything to be logical? Uh, people have this notion out there that, you know, science is not supposed to be rational. Uh, these people are born, they go through this religious uh, indoctrination, they go to church maybe, uh, they hear fantastic explanations, and, you know, then uh, they don't expect a rational answer. So if you're wondering why we have Big Bang, Black Hole, and some of these fantastic theories out there, it's because a lot of these people have been conditioned since they were children to believe in these kinds of stories. You also have bombardment from Hollywood. We get uh, zombies. We have travel to the past, and people stop understanding the difference between reality and fantasy. Here are some of the other answers. It is not irrational and illogical, just non-intuitive. Uh, why should human logic and rationality apply to quantum mechanics? It's man's comprehension of such phenomenon that is illogical and irrational. These people miss the point. It's not that the universe works rationally and that we are not. It's that maybe, just maybe, our uh, math magicians, as I call them, they have not figured out how this universe works. If I give you a theory about angels, well, yes, I have a theory. Does this mean it, it works? You know, angel pushes the earth around the sun. It works. Does this mean that this is the way the universe works? No, and this is the issue, okay? These are some of the statements from the people who founded quantum mechanics. It's not me telling you this now. You can say, I'm a liar, I'm a nobody, fine. Here you have Nobel Prizes. All three of these people are Nobel Prizes. This is what they have to say about their own theory. Niels Bohr, those who are not shocked when they come across quantum theory cannot possibly have understood it. Werner Heisenberg, can nature be, uh, possibly be so absurd that it, as it seemed to us in these atomic experiments, they saw something, they said, we, we don't understand it. Fifty years later, Richard Feynman says, no one understands quantum mechanics. Isn't that something? <laughs> These are the people who founded quantum. They're the people who uh, proselytize. They go out there and try to convince you, and they're saying they don't understand their own theory. And you say, how is this possible? Uh, quantum has been around for, what, 100 years now? And you say, how is it possible that after 100 years, these people are telling you that they don't understand their own theory. What is it that they don't understand? We're not criticizing the equations. We're not saying that Schrodinger's equation is wrong. We're not saying that de Broglie's wave equation is wrong. We're saying that the explanations that they give us, the physical interpretations, are irrational. They're not wrong. They're irrational. And there's a difference. So all these people, you know, they've been, uh, they tell you that they don't understand their own theories. And you say, well, what is that that they don't understand about their own theory? Well, let me give you an, uh, for instance here. What is, what is irrational about quantum? Why it always will be irrational? There's no way they can rationalize this. You have two particles. This is the entire universe. There's no God, no devil, no, uh, no you, no me, no heaven, no hell. This is all there is in the universe, two particles. There is no way you can explain to me in a rational way how this particle gets this one to move, not from a distance. We can all understand push, surface to surface contact. What we cannot understand is pull from a distance. Quantum will never be able to answer pull. And that's why quantum does not incorporate gravity because gravity is some kind of pull force, whatever it is. So you cannot explain how this particle gets this one to move from a distance. Let's go a little deeper. This is the proton. This is the electron. According to the standard model of quantum mechanics, this is the hydrogen atom, right? Why doesn't the electron drift away? 
Why doesn't it fly away? What keeps it bound to the proton? What, does, uh, what do the quantum people propose? Well, they say there's a field. Oh, we got a problem with the word field. Field is a concept, okay? It's a concept. Uh, what if I told you that uh, my dog is tied to the doghouse by love? He's physically restrained by love. Or you can say he's tied by a leash, a chain maybe. But love? That's what we're doing when we're saying a field keeps these two particles together, right? But let's forget about that argument. We can see the field is a physical object. How does it do it? What's the physical mechanism of attraction? How does the field work? Is it like uh, paste, like glue? Is it like uh, tape? Is it like uh, a vacuum cleaner? Sucking the electron in? Why doesn't the electron fly away? What's the mechanism? It's not sufficient to say, oh, it's a field. I could have said X. It's X. So what have you learned? You need to know what the mechanism of the field is. And now let's forget about that argument, too. Uh, Ernst Rutherford, 1919, said an atom is mostly empty space. This is not the quantum atom. Quantum atom is this, empty space. That's the quantum atom. Mostly empty space. So there is no field. So we have three levels of irrationality. We have, we're using a concept as a physical object. Then we're not explaining what the mechanism is, even assuming it were a physical object. And then, you know, Rutherford says, forget about that anyways. An atom is mostly empty space. Now you see why we don't understand the theory. <laughs> it makes no sense, okay? Let's ask Mr. Richard Feynman. It is important to realize that in physics today, we have no knowledge of what energy is. Here is a man who wins a Nobel Prize. All his explanations are based on the word energy. He's telling you we don't know what it is. This word has been around for 2,500 years since the days of Aristotle, who's the first guy who wrote about it. We don't know what it is. Okay, so we don't know what energy is, fine. All of you taken physics? And you've heard of the word mass. We all know what mass is. It's the quantity of matter. That's what they tell you in high school. You take the test and you, all you have to say is, uh, you know, you have A, B, C, you check B because quantity of matter. Well, let's see what they have to say. John Wheeler, Edwin Tadler, two famous gurus of gravitation especially, right? Nature does not offer us any concept of the amount of matter. Even if we could count number of atoms, that number would not equal mass. Notice that he's not telling you what mass is. He's telling you what mass is not. And he says what it is not is the quantity of matter. So what they told you in, in physics in high school is wrong. It's not the quantity of matter. OK, two words, time. We all know what time is, right? You go to school, you go to work. We all have to use time. St. Augustine, fourth, uh, fifth century. What then is time? If no one asks me, I know what it is. If I wish to explain it to him who does not ask, I do not know. We have the same answer today. We have Stephen Hawking, famous uh, British physicist, mathematician, and he tells us that he writes a book, a 200-page book, A Brief History of Time. The only word you will not find in the glossary is the word time. That's the subject, man. He doesn't know what it is. Uh, we have another fellow. His name is uh, Paul Davies. He's a Templeton Prize winner, $1 million, so it's not cheap. And uh, he, uh, he writes a book, 300-page book, about time. I guess it says it all, right? And the only thing he doesn't write about is about time. He doesn't know what time is. So we have all these words that these people use. They, they, they move around. They dilate they move the mass from here to there, they turn this into energy, and none of them know what they're talking about. Of course, then they say, well, you know, we don't understand our own theories. And then we get to the word force. I'm sure that everyone who's uh, read a little bit about quantum knows that the word force is very important in quantum mechanics. Gauge boson, force carrier, bosonic particle that carries 
any of the fundamental interactions of nature carries a force, carries an interaction? Uh, does a bird carry his fly? Uh, does a fish carry his swim? Does a kangaroo carry his jump? I uh, looked at Stephen Crothers there, I remember the kangaroo. Uh, it, it makes no sense. This is irrational language. What do you mean you carry a force? How does a particle carry a force? They carry in his back and then delivers it, delivers pull, delivers push? What is this? We had to invent this kind of language because it is all completely irrational. You have to convey a rational explanation. They don't do this. You'll never find a rational explanation. So what is physics about? In the alternative. I mean, if this is not physics, what is physics? Physics is about explanations. I want to hear a rational explanation. And these people are so far out of the subject that they have a different idea of what physics or what science, they equate science with physics, what physics and science are about. They say, no, physics is not about explanations. Here we have a um, emeritus professor, Donald Simonek, and he says, science does not explain. Science describes. So I describe a chair, four legs, one backrest, seat, that, that's science. I just describe something. So we have a difference of opinion with him, very serious uh, difference of opinion. But the important thing here is that at least he seems to understand that there's a difference between a description and an explanation. Most mathematicians out there are not even aware of that. They think it's the same thing. So what is the difference? Description, listing of properties or behaviors of an object. You know, you have an object, you say this is white, it's got four sides, that's a description. I haven't understood anything, any explanation, I haven't explained anything with that. I just described it. An explanation is the prosecutor's version of how a phenomenon occurred. What happened? How did a magnet attract another one? Why doesn't the Earth uh, fly out of the solar system? Please explain. That's what you need to explain. But describe and say the Earth moves around the sun at 30 kilometers per second, that's a description. What have you explained with that? That's just the question of establishing standards, the meter, the second, and saying, well, we measured, and this is how fast it's going. It's a description. Even if you zero in on the perfect equation, what have you explained with that? Mathematics is not the language of physics. Mathematics is a descriptive language. It's made for describing. The language of physics is illustration. In physics, we deal with objects. And objects, we should be able to illustrate. We should be able to move them around.